So today we are here at Hacker School Introduction to Python. So yeah, uh, if you guys were uh, already here, you, you can just uh, open the Jupyter, no, this uh, Collab Notebook. So this Collab Notebook looks something like this, okay? If you click on the link, you will you reach this page. Okay, sorry, there's, there's still cats online. I need to remove the cats so that it doesn't distract you guys. Okay, the cats are gone. Yeah, there was cats walking along the top of the screen just now. So I didn't want that to distract you guys, so I just got rid of it. Yep. Okay, awesome. So if you guys were to visit that link, you you reach this like collab notebook. We call this a collab notebook. So what you guys need to do is you need to click file and click save a copy in drive. Okay, because uh if you don't save a copy in drive, your code will still run, but you won't be able to save your changes. So like whatever work you do later, you won't be able to save it. So just uh access the link and save a copy in drive. Uh don't worry. Yep. Uh uh Itao, can you help me send the link of the of the notebook to the chat so that they can just access it? Yep. Uh yeah, today we, along with me, I'm I'm Chris, there's Itao and there's a uh, Jing Yan who's helping to teach the workshop as well. Uh Jing Yan is more of just to help you guys answer the question and stuff. Yep. So yeah, let me just first go through the objective of hacker school. So if you guys attended the welcome tea, you have mentioned that I talked about this. So essentially, we just want to get you started on programming and making stuff so you can move on and with the knowledge that you gain from Hackers School, start your own projects. Okay, so we, before we begin, I sort of feel like we need to set some expectations, which is uh, we are not a coding bootcamp. So don't expect, you know, just sit through two hours of Hackers School and you end up end the day, you know, be, becoming like a programming master. Uh, that's not going to happen, number one. And uh. Number two, this is also sort of our first ever online interactive workshop. Okay, in a sense, interactive in, in that we are going to have a few exercises for you guys to do. So, yeah, we are also experimenting. So, uh, if there is like any hiccups or whatsoever, please do like bear with us. We are really just trying out this new format. So, yeah, that is uh, the background of Hacker School and what we are doing here. And uh, on the topic of like, we are not a coding bootcamp. So, like I said, we just want to get you guys started on like programming and making stuff, right? So we are not going to aim to like comprehensively teach you everything about Python, okay? We are not going to just like teach every single language feature, but we are just going to focus on the ones that are the most important. And uh, hopefully that's enough to get you guys started because like, you know, we only have two hours and uh, I'm sure you guys also don't really want to sit through a Zoom call that's longer than two hours. We've been through that before and you know, it, it sort of gets sort of lethargic. So really, we, today we are here just to teach you guys the good stuff. Okay, so this uh, hacker school is part of two-part Python hacker school. So today we are teaching about intro to Python. And what we need to know about today's workshop is, is it's really basic, okay? Uh, it's really about programming. It's about basic Python syntax. So if any of you guys are very adept at programming already, like let's say you are very... Wait, I haven't shared screen yet. Wait, can you guys see my screen? Oh, okay, you guys can see my screen. Okay, this, yeah, sorry. There was someone who told me I haven't shared screen yet, so I was a bit stunned. But yeah, so, um, okay, I'm sorry, a bit distracted. So yeah, I was saying that uh, we are gonna just teach the very basic language features. So don't, so if you guys are already like very adept at other programming languages, let's say you are very good at writing uh, JavaScript or very good at writing Java or etc. Uh, perhaps uh, this workshop really isn't meant for you. We wouldn't take offense if you just drop off now because like we don't want to waste our time too. Okay, but two weeks later um, on, the, on a Saturday again, we are going to have another hacker school that's about automation with Python. So it sort of builds on today's workshop. Today's workshop is about the basic Python and two weeks later, we're going to talk about uh, yeah, like more cool stuff, things like web scraping, things like uh, using Python to help you download YouTube videos automated in an automated manner and stuff. So if you guys are here for the cool stuff, don't worry, you can just drop off now. If not, stay along with us. We'll just run, teach you guys about like uh, cool Python stuff, okay? So about us, uh, well, this is not a very flattering photo of me, but yes, uh, I'm Chris. And along with me teaching this workshop is uh, Itao. Um, we, are for, uh, for, we are core team members of the NUS Hackers core team. And um, both of us, we sort of like uh, use Python extensively in part of our internships before. So we thought we could probably share with you guys some tips and tricks about how to get started with Python. Okay, 
like I said, the workshop objective is really just to be firm, to let you guys be familiar enough with Python. Like we don't need you to be super familiar, but just familiar enough to explore more on your own. And uh, before I start, I just want to talk about what's the best way for to learn programming. So in, in a sense, this title isn't really accurate because there is no best way, but I can just give you some tips and tricks on like how you can best learn programming, okay? So uh, what I would tell beginners to do is really just don't be afraid, always experiment and just play around, okay? Don't be too afraid about making mistakes, just write code and see how it runs and see if like it works the way you, you would like it to, okay? And uh, also, we would also like to encourage people to, you know, whenever you're stuck on something, perhaps you can just Google because like for languages like Python, um, there's a very big community around and a lot of people who, who have already faced the same problems as you, as you. So if you just do a short Google, you, you should be able to find the answer. And um, we also want to like help teach you guys like that it's good to like read documentation. So when you go and like uh, search for like code help, so like Python website and etc. you often, often see like a whole page of documentation and it's good to learn how to read the documentation and how to incorporate it into your code. And uh, of course, to be able to get good at writing code, you need to start writing your own code. You know, a lot of times you are very hesitant to start on writing our own code because like, we don't think we have a very good project or we don't think we are good enough to just start programming. But the fact is, don't think about it and just start, okay? And a lot of times when you write code, uh, you'll face very annoying bugs that you don't know how to fix. But when that happens, just relax and be patient and just like, uh, you know, put on your detective hat and try to like figure out what's wrong with your code. And uh, reading others' code also is very helpful. In fact, it helped me a lot when I was first starting out as a junior programmer as well. Because uh, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's very hard for us to just uh, like attend lessons, attend lectures and somehow know everything about the language. Uh, in fact, the best way to learn is really just reading code from people who write code well. And from them, we, we just sort of like learn the patterns and stuff. So yeah. That's how the tips that can give you about learning programming. And uh, so let me just cover the outline for today's workshop. Uh, essentially, if you guys aren't familiar with programming, all the terms here are gonna be like quite um, gibberish to you. Like you won't understand what they mean. But essentially how this workshop is structured is we're gonna start introducing our tool, Google Colab. So we are using a Colab notebook and we're gonna teach you how the tool works. Then afterwards, we're gonna talk about the very basic building blocks of programming languages such as like arithmetic and data types and they sort of build on top of each other so yep it's gonna we are gonna try to like make the learning curve like less steep for you guys so first question you ask is uh, why learn python and what is python used for i'm sure you guys uh you know today's age people always keep saying you, you we should learn programming and like people always ask you guys to go and learn python but why learn python right so python is actually used in like scientific computing so even fields like astrophysics and all, they also like make use of Python to uh, help them with their research. And uh, machine learning also like very widely uses uh, uh, Python, okay? So like uh, things like, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of like all the very modern AI frameworks like uh, TensorFlow and stuff, all of them actually make use of Python. So if you guys would like to eventually like go into the world of machine learning, learning Python is a very good step to start. And uh, Python is also very good for like algorithm interviews. So like uh, when you apply for a job as a software engineer, there's gonna be uh, coding interviews. And if you guys know Python, it will also help a lot because there's a lot of tools that Python can help you to solve those questions. And a lot of other things because Python is essentially a very versatile language that uh, can do a lot of things. So once again, we need the Collab Notebook. So if you guys just came here, Okay, go, go and visit the link bit.ly slash uh, hs hyphen py hyphen notebook. So uh, just visit the link on your web browser. You can use like a uh, Firefox or Google Chrome, that's fine. And uh, you look, you'll see this uh, collab notebook. And what you guys need to do is click file and click save a copy in drive. Okay, this is a very important step so that your work sort of is, is saved in the notebook. All right. Yeah, so just to give you guys a short introduction of Collab Notebooks. So it's essentially a place for you to write text, okay? So you see there's a lot of text here, but you can also write code along with it. And uh, in fact, when what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run this code snippet. So one plus two minus seven plus 10, right? I'm gonna just press run. 
And this code will actually is actual Python code that's running. Okay, so when you guys try it out on your own, the first time you press the play button, it might take a while to for the first cell to run. But the second cell, okay, suppose I want to run this, it'll run nearly immediately. Okay, and the reason is this is because Google Colette actually runs on Google servers. That means this code is actually running on Google's computer and not your own computer. Okay. And the reason why we chose this tool is because uh, since everything is running on Google server, we don't need to put you through the hassle of like installing Python and stuff. Uh, and we can just get started with writing code. Okay, we, we just get started with all the good stuff, all the cool stuff. Okay, and um, yeah, so essentially this is what Collab Nobo is about. And uh, first topic that we're gonna go through today is uh, basic arithmetic. So um, I'm sure you guys, okay, so one of the challenges we had when we were designing this workshop is that uh, in a physical workshop, you guys would come to School of Computing and join this workshop with us, and you guys will be able to use the projector screen. But right now, you guys are only constrained to just your own screen, and uh, you guys wouldn't know whether to look look at my screen sharing or like uh, just look at the collab notebook, right? So for now, don't worry about it. Just follow my screen. When it's time to for you to like move to your collab notebook, I will tell you guys. Okay. So those are the challenges we sort of had to work with. So I hope you can understand. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to cover, basic arithmetic. Okay, this is the most basic form of computer programs that you can write with Python. So they basically do like plus minus times divide essentially. So I'm sure you guys know how, how to do plus minus times divide. So right now it's six, right? But if I remove the plus 10 and I run it again, okay, it's minus four because six minus 10 is minus four. So this is what I mean by collab notebook, makes it very easy for you to experiment with code because you can sort of just, uh, edit yeah okay yeah, sorry i was looking at the chat yeah you can sort of just edit the uh, edit the code and immediately run it and you can see the result immediately okay so that's how it, it's very easy for you guys to play around okay so going on i'm sure you guys know how to do like multiplication two times six okay for multiplication we use the asterisk for division we use the slash so one divided by two is half okay so over here, you see we have sort of three equations here. And uh, okay, at this point, you guys are probably thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm, I come here to write code, right? But the fun fact is even these type of arithmetic statements, they are actually proper code. So yeah, you guys are not coming here for nothing. And if I, were, uh, if I were to run this code, you will see that, okay, you only see the last output, which is, what, which is half, okay? One divided by two. Why do you not see the rest of this? And the reason is because, uh, uh, when you use Google, Google Colab, it only prints the output of like the last line. So the last line in this case is one divided by two. So it prints half. Okay. So moving on, we're going to uh, talk more about like crazier arithmetic. So things like uh, you probably never heard of before, like integer division. So, okay, let's look at this example first. 12 divided by five. If I were to run it, you will see 2.4. But what if we only wanted the the two, okay. So what we can do is we can actually use the slash 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 operator. It sort of does integer division, okay. So twelve slash slash five, you get two, and uh, one slash slash two. So by right, one divided by two is half, right? But if you do one slash slash two, you get zero, okay. So this is integer division. And then the next thing we're gonna cover is exponentiation. So exponentiation is essentially what we learn in school, like. Uh, b to the power of n, okay? So for example, two to the power of four, we use the star star or asterisk asterisk operator. You just run it and it's two to the power of four and you get 16, okay? This is the same as two times two times two times two because that's the definition of exponentiation, right? And as you can see, we sort of like get the same result, yeah. And the next thing that I'm gonna, write, gonna uh, go through is the modulo operation. So modulo is something that a lot of you guys probably never heard of before, but essentially it just gives you the remainder, okay, remainder of a division oper operation. So A modulo B will give you the remainder when you divide A by B. Yep, Daniel, you're right that it that is different. In some other languages, they use like, like other operators, but in Python, they, they use star star for exponentiation, okay? So yeah, for modulo, Okay, again, sorry, sidetrack. I got sidetracked again. Okay, I shall I shall look less at chat, but if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask in chat. There's uh, people there who are willing to like answer your questions. We we have yeah, we have people there answering your questions. I shall look at chat less often. Okay. So back to modulo. 
Okay, so if you look at 51 divided by 4, okay, I'm going to run it, and you see that it has some remainder, right, because it's not divisible. So if you would want to get like the remainder of it, we, we just do 51 modulo 4. And what we get is the remainder, because uh, the, it's, it's sort of like a 48 remainder 3. So the remainder 3 is just what you get from the modulo operator. All right. Okay, so right now is the time for you guys to like try it out yourself. Okay, and the first challenge for you guys is to use Python to figure out if this very long number is a multiple of 517217. So with what we've gone through earlier, how do you do this? Okay, so we shall spend the next three minutes. You guys can alternate tab to your notebook and try uh, to see how you can come up with, to use Python to check if it's a multiple or not. And you can start now. Okay, I'm gonna just uh, clear all the responses. If you guys are done with this challenge, uh, just put a yes in the participant thingy. Okay, so the first challenge is to use Python to figure out if this large number is a multiple of 517217. So using your collab notebook. So you alternate tab to your collab notebook and you scroll down to this cell this challenge one and you try to type code that uh, actually can achieve what the challenges what, what the challenges what the, what the challenge is about yeah oh okay so you guys are typing yes in the chat but okay so when you click on the participants tab in zoom right there's actually this button this green buttons that says yes no and blah you can sort of just click on, on it to indicate that you are you have completed it. Um, Daniel, yeah, we don't need a boolean statement for now. Uh, we'll go through what boolean boolean statement is later. Don't worry. Okay, so we right now we sort of have a uh, twenty three people who who have sort of completed it. So. Okay, maybe we just uh, come back to look at my screen. Okay, I sort of can just run through with you guys how we can do this. So, um, so, so we, should, we can just copy this number here. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can sort of just do a test, right? Just take this number, divide with this number. And obviously what we can see is that it's sort of a whole number. And from this, if it's a whole number, we can sort of like determine that, you know, it's, a, it's divisible, right? But actually there's a better way that programmers usually do, they use modulo, okay? So you just take this number and divide by 517217 and we check if what the remainder is. And the remainder is zero. So if the remainder is zero, it means that it's a multiple, all right? So that's how we can sort of use uh, Python to sort of help us do things like this. But okay, this is just a very simple example. We can move on with it. Okay, so when we talk about arithmetic, we've learned a lot of operators just now. Okay, we can actually sort of just put them all together. Just put, like, it's just like writing mathematical equations and all. In fact, if you look at this, okay, if you run this, you get negative 1.5. And you run this, you get zero. Okay, the difference is really just using brackets to denote the order of operations. It's just like doing math. Okay, uh, of course, uh, it's the same in math, such that things like multiplication, and division you have to do first but because over here we use a bracket to denote that this uh, subtraction has to be done first uh, this would this uh, multiplication would be done first okay and of course uh, there's really a lot of operators you can use in python but um, fret not we can you can just read just read about it on your own uh, with this link in fact actually what we've taught you is more than sufficient for most of your needs uh, Habib, you asked me if you can just run it on idle. If you can run it on your own idle, yes. But uh, if you want to follow along with our workshop content, you can just uh, use the collab notebook as well. Yep. Okay, so right now we move on to the second challenge. The second challenge is about okay, the length of the hypotenuse. Okay, so recall that we have a formula for finding the hypotenuse. Okay, it's uh, A equals to square root of B squared plus C squared, right? So um, 
right now the challenge for, for you guys is to use Python code to sort of come up with the hypotenuse of a triangle with sides B equals to three and C equals to four. So how do you guys do this? Uh, yeah, we can have uh, another three minutes for you guys to uh, work on this. And when you guys are done, you can put yes in the in the participants panel as well. Okay, awesome. We have around 23 people who indicated that they are done, done with this. So perhaps you guys can come and look back at my screen where I'll go through how we can better do this. Okay, so of course you guys have, haven't really written much code before. So we sort of have to like build up like this expression, right? So the first thing we have, we have to look at is this expression. Expression is a B square plus C square. Then after you get the result, okay, we, we just raise it to a power of half. All right. So actually what we can do is we can try to try the b square first. So b square b is three, right? So we can do three square. And three square is nine. So we sort of get the b square part done. So now that we are confident enough to write the the b square part, we can also do the c square part. Okay. So c is four. So we can write four square. All right. Now we have the b square and the c square part done. Okay. Now what we want to do is we want to raise the whole thing to a power of half. So again, just write brackets over the whole thing and just raise it to a power of half. And you get 5.0. Or in fact, if you really want, wanted to follow the fraction, you can just power 1 over 2 and you will still get the same result. All right. So that's how you solve it. At, at the moment, it will look very mechanical, but later we will teach you how to make you guys, how to make you guys uh, do it in the like, uh, in a way that makes it look smarter, okay? Yeah, so that's how you solve for hypotenuse in Python. So next, I'm going to introduce the concept of variables, okay? So back to my slides, okay? So if you, it's the first time you guys are writing uh, like in a programming language, you, you guys probably haven't really heard much about variables. So variables are essentially names for you to associate certain values or references to, okay? So look at this statement I have here. A equals to five. Now, 
you can sort of think of it as A like representing the value 5 at the moment. So we call this equal operator and assignment operator. It reads whatever that's on the right. So at the one that's on the right now is 5 and it assigns it to the variable name on the left, which is A. All right. So in Python, we have a few rules regarding variable names. So just now the variable name we had here is A. Okay. So for variable names, you cannot like type any spaces. You can only use letters and like numbers and underscore character. And it can only be it cannot begin with a number number. And um so when you when you do okay, when you write programs in certain program programming languages, right? There's certain conventions that we should follow. So for example, for Python, right? The convention is to use snake case. Okay, so what is snake case? Snake case is essentially like a, you replace spaces with an underscore. So for example, suppose I have a variable that's called hacker school. The right way to write it in snake case would be hacker underscore school. Okay. Um, so the second example, hacker space school, this won't work at all because there's a space over here. This won't work at all. But the last two examples will still work, just that it's not following like the convention. Okay, so because, why 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 do they not follow the convention? Is because uh, this one starts with an uppercase, and this is actually what we okay. You probably see this in other programming languages such as like JavaScript or like Java. Okay, they use something else called camel case. So they make the first letter like small, then the second letter, the second word they capitalize it. So this is called camel case, and Python doesn't really like encourage that. Python encourages snake case. Okay, so uh, just to give an but like like a example of like variables and how we can use them. Okay, so when we type something like a equals to five, you can think about it as like you having a cookie jar. Okay, and the cookie jar has a name called five, so it's like a sticker, and then you just put the number five inside the cookie jar. Okay, so let's look at these three lines of code: a equals to eight, b equals to thirteen, c equals to a plus b. Okay, so I mean this is this is probably pretty obvious for all of us. So let's just like like look at the example. So what happens is that first time I will code a equals to eight. We went through that just now. So now you have a b equals to thirteen. Okay. So what happens is that you have another cookie jar called b, and it stores the number thirteen in it. And then now you have c. Okay. C now stores a plus b. So a plus b is sort of have, has to like refer to the other cookie jars to figure out what numbers they are before it adds them up together. So it looks like cookie jar A and cookie jar B and add them up together. So 13 plus 8 is 21. And that's what's inside C. Okay. So uh, when you guys see like a few lines of code, really just like step through each of them line by line and you guys will be able to figure out what's happening. Okay. So back to the collab notebook. Okay. What you see here is uh, variables, right? So again, what we did just now was A equals to 5. And this is the same example when I run this. Okay, C equals to A plus B, you get 21. And you, you realize that I put A, B, C here, but you, then you only see 21 over here. And again, that is because collab notebooks only print the last value and variable that they see in the code cell. Okay. And uh, there are a few other like shortcuts and like nicer ways that we can de uh, declare A and B as well. So for example, A comma B equals to 8 comma 13. So it, it's, it does the same thing. It just puts it uh, like 8 assigns to A and 13 assigned to B. Okay. And then if I were to run this, you realize that right now it actually prints all three um, results out. Okay. And that's because I use the print function. So right now I'm going to introduce you guys to the print function. So print function essentially is just, it, it, it does what it says, like it prints stuff and it just prints whatever is in between what you give it. Okay. So for example, I print 7, 5, and 1. You will see all three of them here, okay. And um, oh, another thing about collab notebooks is that uh, so like this code cell is a separate cell from this and separate cell from this, right? But actually, the results do persist. So if I run a, you get it because previously we declared it like a as it, okay. So you can you can just do this or you can do you can do like a print as well, print, and it will just do the same thing, you just print it as well. Okay. So right now, like I said, we we're gonna like um we're gonna do like we are gonna like write your hypotenuse formula in a smarter way, right? So we have a variables mini challenge. So just go look at this in your collab notebook and uh, we can see how we can 
write the hypotenuse formula in a smarter way. So you can give it a try now. All right, if you are done, can you just indicate yes in the participant panel? Okay, awesome. We have around 22 people who are done now. So let's just come back to my screen and I'll just share how we can do this. Okay. So over here we have a none now. And if we were to run it, it will just print out none. Like it will just print nothing. Right. So we want to change this formula to work with x and y. So, I, so like uh, the previous formula we had just now is uh, uh, x squared plus y squared. Right. So x squared plus y squared. And then the whole thing we can sort of just uh, raise it to the power of half. So that's the formula for our hypotenuse, right? So when you run this right now, you will see 5.0, which is the result that we saw earlier. So uh, why we prefer to write things this way is because, okay, suppose uh, you had triangles of like other dimensions, dimensions, you wouldn't want to just directly change the formula. You can just sort of just change like your the input you give it. So for example, if I had a triangle that has a, has a base of like a 20 and a height of 35. I can just change X and Y like that and just run it again. And immediately it will give me the new result. Okay. So this is why it's nice that we can represent things in terms of variables because it really just uh, makes the code look a lot cleaner and a lot more formularish. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, I'll go and talk about data types. Okay. So when you guys uh, deal with variables in Python, you need to know that uh, certain variables are represented differently. So essentially, if you are re representing numbers like integers without any like decimal points, right? Integers, they'll be represented as ints, like int, ints, we call it ints. And if your number has decimal points, you'll be represented as something called a float, okay? Uh, these are terms that you don't really have to go into detail about what they are, but you can you just need to know that they are represented in such a way. And if you have text, they will be represented as string, str, string. And if it's a true or false value, it will be represented as something called a boolean, which is bool, b o l. Okay. So, uh, you can use this function called type. Okay, this type will tell you like what what's the type that you are dealing with. So, for example, I have a string here. And if I run type on it, it'll tell me that it's a string. If I run type on the number five, it'll be an int. If I run type on 5.0, it'll be a float. Okay. So moving on, we'll go, we'll go back to our collab notebook. As in my collab notebook, you guys don't need to like tab out at the moment. Okay. So we just go through like some of the basic data types. So like five will be an int. And uh, in Python 3, there's also like no limit as to how long an integer value can be. Okay because uh, they sort of like do some magic behind so that you don't have to care about any limits or whatsoever. So the background behind this is uh, in computers, there's actually like certain limits as to how, how, how high your number can go. So yeah, in Python, you don't really have that problem unless you are working with like really, really, really long numbers. So for example, even such a long number like this, it can just add them up as well. This is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three plus one. 
Okay. So 4.2 is an example of a float. Okay. Okay, so 4.2 it has a decimal point, so it'll be represented as a float. And um this is something new that you guys probably would never have seen before, but this E type of thing. Okay, so this E is sort of like a notation for like 10 to the power 2. Okay, what this means is this is 4.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4. So I'm sure if you guys do things like chemistry or like physics, okay, very often often you need to like uh, multiply by like 10 to the power of minus 3 and like 10 to the power of minus 9 and etc. So this thing is is it's just it's sort of like a method to make it neater for you to write numbers like this. Okay, so like 4.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4 is, is this value here. And this is just like the less nice way of writing this 4.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4. Right? It's the same thing. Then 4 point is like 4.0. Like it's just a different way of writing 4.0 that like you can just put like Python is very permissive. You can just you can just put a, a just a decimal point and you just write it as 4.0. In fact, I'll be curious to see what type this is. So type float is a float. But if I were to, were to remove the decimal point, then it will become an int, right? So yeah, this is what this is again. I recommend for you guys to sort of just uh, experiment with it and uh, try it out yourself. It will help to enhance your understanding. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna teach is a string. A string is like a, it's basically text that's enclosed by quotation marks. Okay, so you see these quotation marks here, and there's also a quotation mark here. So this is what makes things become a, things become a string. And if I run this, it will tell you that it's a string. And it, so you, you can just alternate between like double quotes and single quotes. Uh, in Python 3, it doesn't really matter, but in Python 2, it does. But th that's what you need to know. But the version of Python we're writing now is Python 3. Nobody really uses Python 2 anymore. But if you guys were to like uh, work on some very old project, you might face Python 2 code and you realize that they don't use double quotes. Okay. So if you have a multi-line string that is like, that spans multiple lines, you can use like this triple, um, triple quotation mark thingy. And it's also a string as well. Okay, so back to the slides. Okay, what, what I'm gonna teach next is string concatenation. So look at this uh, example, Alice plus Bob, it becomes Alice Bob. So the, the thing that you need to get from this slide is uh, it's really just joining the strings together, right? So why do you need such a complicated term called concatenation? And uh, the point of this slide is for me to tell you that, you know, uh, when you read code, around here and around the internet, they, they use certain jargons that we probably need to like um, understand and concatenation is probably one of them. So yeah, you can sort of just join strings together like that. And this is called string concatenation. So if you try to add like 42, a number to like a string, uh, Python will give you an error. They will tell you that I can only concatenate a string and a string. Okay, so back to the notebook. Yeah, back to the notebook. Uh, what we have here, we have apple, beetroot, and carrot. So if you do A plus B plus C, and as, as expected, you will see like apple, beetroot, carrot merge together. Okay, as you can see, it looks a bit messy now because there's no spacing, right? So you can sort of just add your own. Like add one space here, add one space here, and you just run it. And when joined together, it will be apple, beetroot, and carrot. Okay, so like I said just now, if you were to add something that's different, right, it will not allow you to do so. Let's say I add 5.0. Okay, let's see what happens. It will tell you that it's not allowed because it must be a string, not a float. Okay, so what if I change this to a string? Okay, so yeah, it, uh, it sort of just uh, turns this into a string and adds it to the end. So now it's 5.0 is here. And in fact, you can actually do things like adding D to D. Okay, so right now D is like apple, beetroot, carrot, right? And now we are making D. And like we are making D this thing and we add D again. So what would the result look like? Apple beetroot carrot, apple beetroot carrot 5.0. So yeah, it's, it, it might be a bit hard to wrap your head around, but if you think about it, it makes sense. All right. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm gonna go through is F strings. So in Python 3.6, uh, right now we, the latest version of Python is around 3.8. So you guys are quite safe to use this feature. There's something called F strings. So f strings is a way to format your strings with other variables. 
Okay, so suppose if I didn't use F strings and I wanted to print like hello, you are something, I can just run this. Okay, hello Thomas, you are 21. And uh, I sort of have to do very like weird things such as adding things up together and it sort of doesn't look like a very whole coherent sentence. But if you were to use F strings, okay, so like Thomas, is, now name is Thomas and age is 21, right? I can sort of just add an F at the start, okay? It's sort of like adding an F over here. Then this will be turned into an F string and it has additional features such as like, um, you can just put like the variable inside the string itself and then you add like a, this curly brace around to signify that it's a variable, okay? And if I were to run it, it will say, hello Thomas, you are 21, okay? So just to like, but let's say my hobby is like uh, drinking coffee, okay? And then you can do things like, I like to hobby. And then if I were to run it again, you will see, I like to drinking coffee, which isn't really right English. Yeah, but you can sort of get why this is sort of slightly better to read than this, because this sort of requires you to just add things together. So these are F strings and uh, I encourage you guys to use them. So the next thing we are going to move on to is the F strings challenge. Okay. Um, so go back to your uh, go, go back to your collab notebook and uh, we can try to turn this uh, statement that wasn't that doesn't have F string to into an F string statement. So when, when you guys are able to do this, just uh, put yes in the participant panel. Happy birthday, Thomas. So apparently we have a participant, Thomas, he's turning 21 tomorrow. Yeah, if you guys are able to complete the F-string challenge, just uh, put a yes. If not, just uh, try it out, give it your best shot to see if you can do it or not. Okay, it seems that more people are struggling with this. There's 11 people who are done now. Uh, we just try for one more minute and we come back. Awesome, we have 20 people who are done. So perhaps you guys can just look back at my screen. Okay, so the first thing first to turn this into an F string statement, right? So we have uh, three variables over here, name, age, and motivation. So we need to fit this into the string. So you can just put my name is name. Okay, no, but the first thing we need to do, okay, so you realize that it's still red, right? Because it's not being recognized as like a variable. But if I have to add an F here, then this suddenly turns black because we need to add an F to turn it into F string, okay? So my name is name, and I, I, I'm H this year, and I'm learning Python because 
motivation. Right? So this is like how the sentence sort of looks like. And if we were to run it now, you realize that it doesn't work. Because why? We actually haven't filled in the variables here. So your name, you need to fill out your name. My name is Chris and my age is, I am 10. Okay, so the, why do, why was my motivation for learning Python? Because it's cool. Okay, so if I were to run it now, you will see, hi, my name is Chris, I'm 10 this year, I'm learning Python because it's cool. So, right, you realize that I, I sort of avoided something, okay? It, because it is cool, by right, I should type it this way, right, with an apostroph apostrophe. But when I type it this way and I run it, Python gives me an error. It says it is invalid syntax. Because why? Because it is how you write a string. You start with a quotation mark and you end with a quotation mark. And it's recognizing this as like a as like an end of string. And, and so it's, it's sort of messed up. So one way to get around this is you can add a backslash. Backslash sort of tells Python that uh, it's not part, it's actually part of the string and it's not like ending the string. Okay. So if I were to run this, you will say, because it's cool. But there's another way to solve it as well. Remember I told you that you can, you guys can actually use double quotes as well to write a string. So I'm, I'm just going to turn this into double quotes. And uh, if I were to just write it this way, right now the single quote isn't ambiguous anymore. And it works too, right? My name is Chris, I'm telling you I'm learning Python because it's cool. Okay. And um, yeah. So that is how things are. That, that's how things are. And we cover F strings. Okay. So right now we're going to cover something called uh, Boolean values. Okay. Boolean values is something that if you guys have never done any programming, you guys will be new to, like, but it's really just two possible values, true or false. Okay. And you have to start with a capital T and, and, or F. Okay. You cannot write like small t, true, or small f, false. Okay. And, um, I'm also going to introduce to you guys comparison operators. So these things sort of like can allow you to make some comparison. So like whether like, like something is equal to something or something is greater than something, we use these sort of operators. Basically this like it tests for equality, equals equals, or like not equal to, okay? And uh, I can give you some example. So 140 is more than 50. And that's correct, right? I mean, mathematically it's true. So it will give you true. But if 140 is less than 50, it gives you false. So, and then now right now we are comparing two strings. It is uh, Chris equals to cool. And Chris is not cool, right? So it's false. But, and it, but it's Chris equals to Chris. And that is true. So it gives you true. Okay. So uh, that might be a bit confusing, but we'll go through that on the notebook later. Okay. And we, there's also something I want to introduce called Boolean operators. So uh, there's three keywords that we need to know here and or or not so these are three different operators that people use uh, to like uh, to like it's just useful for a lot for many things so the end operator just sort of just uh, returns true okay if both boolean values provided to it is true or returns true if either boolean values provided to it are, are true okay this is a bit blur now but i will explain it in the notebook later and not operator, so it's just negates the corresponding Boolean value. Okay, confusing, yes. Let me go to the notebook. Okay, so again, this is a Boolean value. I'm gonna assign A to true right now. And uh, let me just print out A. And it will tell you that it's true. Okay, so right now I'm gonna do a string comparison. Is the string Chris the same as the string cool? And it says false. Okay, so Chris is not cool, Python doesn't lie. Okay. Is Chris unequal to cool? Chris is unequal to cool. And of course, that is true because Chris is not cool. Chris is Chris. And Chris is Chris, of course, it returns as true. Okay. And then things like uh, 42 more than 100, we, we've covered this just now. So right now, we, we are moving on to the Boolean operators. That's where it got a bit confusing. Okay. So right now, we, let's try true and true. Okay. True and true will give you true but true and false will give you false okay let's try something that is like a uh, false and true okay like i said and sort of requires both sides to be true for it to be return true but since one side is false now as expected it will return false 
Okay, I hope you guys are not too lost. Okay, I will show you like how this will be useful later over here. Okay, so but I'll cover all first. So if true or true, because uh, we just need one side to be true, because it's all, this, this guy will return true. If true or false, since one side is true already, it will come back as true. So you, as you can see, it's true or true. But what if we do things like print, false or false? Like I said, all sort of requires either side to be true. So if, I, if both sides are false, of course it will come back as false. It's taking a while. Yep, false. Okay, so how we can use certain things like that is suppose we wanted to test if a number is divisible by three or divisible by five. Okay, you can just do things like that. True, okay. In fact, let me abstract this further. So I put number equals to 15. Then I can put number modulo three and number modulo five. Okay, so right now it still returns true, right? So the next number that so uh, another number that sort of fulfills both conditions is like 45. So 45 will give you true. Yeah, it gives you, it gives you true. My math isn't wrong. But suppose if I change this to something that only fulfills one of the condition. Okay, suppose 20. Okay. 20 will return true for this because 20 is divisible by 5. But 20 will return false for this. So this comes back as false, okay? So as expected, 15 is uh, divisible by three, but not divisible by two. So this will come back as false, all right? And um, right now the last operator that I'm talking about is not. So not basically just negates whatever it sees over here. So not true is just false. Uh, the, the, Collab notebook is taking a while to run. Okay. So, but if you do a not, not true, of course, it becomes true. Okay. So that's how like Boolean operators work. So right now I've sort of covered most of the, the part, the points about the, uh, the basic data types and like the Boolean values and like just arithmetic. Uh, right now we'll, we can sort of have like a three minutes break and you guys can sort of ask questions or catch up. Uh, you guys can like go to the washroom or whatever. Uh, but after we come back, uh, Ita will continue talking about flow control, which is like if and else and stuff. So yeah, just uh, go ahead and go for your three minute break. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Yep, it's how I can you can start sharing your screen. Yep. If your mind is back, can please give a green kick sign for the participants then.
once again, those who are back uh, can give a green tick in the participants panel. I'll start, it's been three minutes. Okay, so now I'll move on to um, flow control. So, um, why, why do we need flow control? Uh, sometimes you want like certain blocks of code to execute like only uh, on, like, when a certain condition is fulfilled, or you want like a certain block of code to like execute repeatedly. So this is when you need like flow control statements. So like the first flow control statement we go through is called, called the if else. So um, how it works is basically, um, you have an if keyword, and after the if keyword, you uh, have a Boolean expression that evaluates to a Boolean. So um, how this uh, block of code will run is if the name is equals to Alice, then you will print hi Alice. Otherwise, it will print um, hello stranger. So it's either this or this. Uh, it will not like print both of these statements. So um, now I'll introduce this concept called the blocks of code. So as you can see, like there's this um, for spacing in you can in Python the convention for indentation is like uh, for using four spaces to indent. Yeah. Uh, normally in uh, most text editors you can use use a tab key and the editor will automatically convert the tab to four spaces. Yeah. Um, but if your editor doesn't do that, then you cannot mix tabs and spaces in the same Python program. So you you, you will throw a, a, a error. Um, so you, for so why do we introduce this concept of blocks of code? So how um, the if, if the if statement is evaluated to true, then the entire block of code under the if statement uh, will be re evaluated. So um, as the, if the, if statements are in the same block of code if they are indented at the same level, so like the same four spaces, yeah. And also, also like we have this uh, this statement called else if, so which is basically shorthand for else if, yeah. So um, this basically is like if name is equals to Alice, you'll print hi Alice. And else if name is equals to Bob, you'll print hi Bob. And otherwise you'll print hello stranger. Okay, so now we'll move on to while loops. So a while loop is kind of like an if statement that you will repeatedly uh, keep on executing the block of code if the condition is true. So um, you see like this, this example here. Um, at first spam is equals to zero. And then um, while spam is less than five, so initially when spam is zero, uh, zero is less than five. So this this statement evaluates to true. And so if it evaluates to true, it will enter the while loop. So this whole block of code here is indented by small spaces. So it's in the same block of code, and you evaluate it. So it will print hello world, and um, you increment spam by one. So spam is now equals to spam plus one. So zero plus one is equals to one. And after after it reaches the last statement you will jump back to the start of the while loop again and you evaluate the same statement. So one is still less than five. You print hello world again and it will keep on doing this for five times so until spam reaches five. And you, when, when, spam, when spam is equal to five, you evaluate the statement. Uh, five is not less than five, so it's false. So when, when the while statement evaluates to false, it will exit the while loop and it will print done. Okay, now, now um, we, as you can see, like, this, this is one way of doing it. There's also another way of doing it, which is using the break statement. So what the break statement does is basically, it, when it reaches the break statement, you will exit the entire while loop. No, and you will not continue to execute whatever statements there are left. So this, this, this program will print hello world five times, similar to the last statement. So at first while spam is equal to zero, and if spam is equal to five, you will break. So right now it will not break because uh, yeah, if the condition is not fulfilled and you print hello world for five times and when spam is incremented to five you will you will hit this if statement and you will evaluate the break statement so you will exit the entire while loop and you will print done 
Okay, but usually uh, most of the time when you do programming, you don't use while loops because the syntax is like quite long, as you can see. Yeah, so usually we use like this thing called a for loop. And also the for loop, uh, and come, also we usually use it with a range, this thing called a range function. So uh, the range function is basically, uh, it returns a sequence of numbers starting from zero all the way up to and excluding the number that you provide. So this will give a range uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Yeah, and so this will ex execute the, the statement hello, uh, print hello world five times and you'll print done. So it, it, you see this, it's much more concise than the while loop. And it's also like less error code because like what if you forget to increment the, the value or what if you like the, somehow you change the, the, the variable span here. So it's like in, in some other statement. Yeah, so this, this is a much, much less error code way of doing things. Um, okay, so now we will move to the collab notebook. Uh, and we wait for this to connect to an instance. Okay. Okay, so now I'll explain this, this chunk of code here. Um, as you can see, usually when you, first time when you, you look like a, like a huge chunk of code, you might get intimidated, but um, just, just like, you can just read it like line by line slowly. Yeah. So at first name is Carol and age is 3000. So if name is equal to Alice, it will print hi Alice. But name, the name is Carol, so it will, it will not execute this chunk. And else if the age is less than 12, um, but our age is 3000, so you will not execute this chunk. Else if age is greater than 2000, it will print this line. So as you can see, it prints, it does indeed print this line. But as you can see, the age is also greater than 100. But this line is not being printed. And that's because um, in the if, else, else, if, else um, chain, the only one of the, uh, the statements will be, if only the first condition that's evaluated to true will be executed. The rest of the conditions, um, yeah, they will, they, will just, they will just exit out of the entire if else chain. Yeah. Okay, so this is a more complicated example of a while loop. Um, so here we have, uh, we are introducing this function called an input function. It's a built-in function. So what it does is it basically pauses the execution of the program and waits for user input. And when the user keys in the input and it hits and the user hits enter, that the program will continue execution and you assign what the user typed in as a string to the variable here. So this program, um, we will just run it. So at first it prints, who are you? And then as you can see, it will just pause execution in, uh, for indefinitely until we change something. So we can type in here. So let's say, let's say we just type in another name. Yeah, so let's say, let's say it's Jane. And, and it asks us, who are you again? And that's because um, if name is not equal to Joe, there's a continuous statement here. So what a continuous statement does is it will immediately jump back to the start of the while loop and it will evaluate the statement in the while loop. So, so it will not continue here. Yeah, it will just like jump back to the start of the while loop and, and it will print who are you again. So now if we type in Joe, okay, uh, Joe. Okay, so now, now it does not evaluate this if statement. The, 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 yeah, so it will continue here. Um, Hello, Joe, what is the password? So the password is another input. And if we clean the correct password, which is swordfish, and then it will break out of the entire while loop. Yeah, if not, if not, it will continue jumping, it will jump back here and ask you who are you again. Yeah, so let's just key in that. And then it will exit the while loop and print access granted. Okay, so now we'll move on to the for loop. So as you can see, if we print like this, um, this I here, the for loop starts from zero all the way until, but excluding the number that you give it. Yeah, so this will just print, um, print the i for five times from zero, one, two, three, four. So usually in programming, um, people uh, you count starting from zero, and you you just like um, it's, it's convention to count from zero. Yeah. So um, in the range function, can also like uh, accept like two arguments. So here you have the first argument is called the start, and the second argument is called the stop. So what what this will do is it will start instead of starting at zero, it will start at twelve instead. And it will end at 16. But what it means that end at 16 is actually the 16 is not included. The 16 is exclusive. So this will just print uh, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yep. And in fact, you can even add a third argument called a step. So um, it's the step is basically how big of increment to move. So this will print all the even numbers from 10 up to 20. So 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Yep. 
And in fact, you can you can also make this like uh, this can also be negative. Yeah. So if you can if you want to count backwards from from twenty to ten, you can also do that. So this will be 20, 19, 18. Yeah. So sometimes this this might be useful. Okay. So this is a potentially tricky question. Like uh, we will move on to our flow control challenge. So uh, we will we'll give you maybe uh, five minutes for this. Yeah. So don't worry if you can't figure out because this is not the easiest uh, challenge. So we will for this challenge. Uh, there's a for loop, and we want to look through all the integers from one to hundred. Inclusive of 100. So if the integer is divisible by 15, you print fizz bus. If it's only divisible by 3, you print fizz. Then if it's only divisible by 5, you print bus. And if it's neither divisible by 3 or 5, you print the number. Yeah, so I'll give you about 5 minutes. And if you are, if you are done, please uh, indicate in the participants and you will print it. So far, I only see two ticks. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I'll give like a few more minutes. Yep, just give it a try, guys. It's a, it's actually a pretty tough challenge for beginner programmers. So if you guys can do it, I think it's very nice. So someone asked how to convert to dark mode. Um, yeah, so you can see there's a the settings here. Like, and you can change the theme here.
Shall we go through? So uh, we need all the integers from one to hundred inclusive. So we cannot we need to use the, the range function with uh, two inputs. So for i in range one to hundred. And you know, actually, actually the last number is exclusive, so we cannot put hundred, we need to put hundred and one. Yep. So starting from one to all the way up until hundred, not including hundred and one. So if i is divisible by 15. So how you check divisibility, you use the modular operator and you check that the remainder is equal to zero. You print uh, this bus. I'll just copy the value here if it allows me to so you print this bus. Else if, sorry, in Python it's else if, uh, i is divisible by 3. It's equals to z. So you print this. Otherwise, if it's divisible by five, plus. if it's neither divisible by three or five or fifteen, then I will print the number. Okay, so the most important thing is that because if it's divisible by fifteen, it's also divisible by three and divisible by five. So we actually need to put the divisible by fifteen statement first. Yeah, because otherwise, uh, if we say, if we put like say, uh, we put this statement behind the, 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 the modulo tree, then if we have a 15 here, then it will be divisible by tree. Then we just print fist instead of fist bus. But if we put the statement here first, then it will execute fist bus. And instead of, and it will, not, it will skip the rest of the if else statement. Yeah, so the, the most important thing is that this one must, must be first. Yeah. So if you, if you run this, then you have a long chain of, yeah, so, if I'm not wrong, you can hide the output. If the, okay, I, I don't think okay, there's, there's no collapse output here, but um, if, 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 if the output gets a bit too long, you can right click, right click on the cell and you can just like uh, clear output. Yeah, so, so you can like, it's easier for you to scroll. Okay, next we'll move back to the slides. So move on to functions. Oh yeah, so uh, actually, you know, before that, the fist fast test is like, uh, in the past it was like this interview question that was Design help to fill to tell out ninety nine point five percent of programming job candidates who can't program their way out of a web paper backflow. And if you guys solve this successfully, you're uh, you can congratulate yourself. Yeah, okay, so now we move on to functions. Um, so the functions is basically like uh, it's a group of statements that performs a specific task. And why do we use functions? Um, okay, it might not be clear now, but I will explain it later. So functions actually help to break our program to smaller and modular chunks. So you can bundle up a bunch of like statements into a, the same function name. And you can just call that function name without having to repeat the same chunk of, the same block of statements over and over again. So it makes the code reusable. Okay, so uh, how functions in Python looks like is basically, we have this, uh, we start with a keyword called def, which is define. Uh, and then we followed by a space and a, hard, and a function name. After that, you open parentheses and then you include the function parameters. If you have multiple function parameters, you just separate them with a comma, so like name or comma, age, so on. And after that, you have a colon again. And after that, you include all the, all the statements that the function, all the statements that belong to the function, you indent them by one indentation level, so it's four spaces. Yeah, so if they are not indented by four spaces, they will not be in the function. So after that, you can call, after you define the function, you can call the function by uh, calling the, typing in the function name, and then you open parentheses, and then you put in the, all the function parameters separated by co uh, comma. So if you, if you call this, it will, it will print out hello Tom. Yeah, so this, this Tom will be sent to the function as a, as, under, under the variable name, and it will, it will, the, so this, this variable name will be Tom. Okay, so why use functions? So let's say you have this program, you can even want like, uh, hello Jane, hello Tom, and hello world. And then suddenly the next day, uh, maybe the requirements change, and you actually uh, say, like, change it to good morning. So if you don't have functions, then you have to change good morning in three different spaces. And it, it's very error prone because you might make a typo mistake in one of those uh, places. And so you might have, the program might not just be these three lines. There might be like, say, a few hundred lines between here, and you have to search like where, where this print statement occurs. So you have to search. Like, oh, hello, hello here, and hello there. So yeah, it's, it's very troublesome. It's, it's error code. 
so in using functions, you just uh, define hello name and, and, and then you call you call the function three times. So next time when you change, you just need to change the function itself. You don't need to change any of the function callers. Yeah, so this, you, this is why one of the reasons that we use functions uh, where a lot in programming. Okay, so a function that's, uh, so you can see that how a function takes in a value. A function can also like output a value like using a return, return statement. So a return statement is, consists of a return keyword and also the value or expression the function should return. After the function returns, it immediately exits and does not execute any of the remaining statements under the function. So you can see our example here. Um, so hello guess number. So if guess number is equal to one, it will return Sarah. And after this point, it will not execute any of the remaining statements. Even if this is like, even if there's a last statement here, it will just exit the function immediately after the return. So the return is always the last statement the function will execute. Yeah. So but if, if this if this num guess number is not equal to one, it will not return though. It will, it will just it will execute the next else if guess number equals to two, then it will return four. And if it's not one or two, then it will return unknown. Okay, so now we move to the collect notebook. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this is just to familiarize yourself with like how the uh, syntax highlighting in the function looks like. So um, this is one example of function that returns for it two every time. Yeah, and the function body must be indented four spaces. And so all these statements belong to the function. But if it's not false places, then this will not be like this, this, this will not be part of the function. And how you call a function is basically the name of the function followed by open parenthesis. Yeah, so the two brackets tell you tell Python that you are calling the function. Yeah, without the two brackets, the function will not be executed. So this is a, a example of a function that takes in a, a, a parameter called x and it returns x plus two. So if we we just execute these blocks. Oh yeah, if, if, if I haven't went through this, you can press uh, shift enter to execute a cell. Yeah. So if if we yeah, so if we do not execute the, the cell here, then if we try to add two here, then it will, it will say that the function is not defined. So right now if we add two, um, it, will, it, will, it will be four, you return four. And also you can nest function like this. So how, how this works is before the function uh you, it, so it, the, all the parameters of the function must be evaluated before the function itself uh, ex ex gets executed. So at first, it will just evaluate this param uh, function parameter, which is add, add 2 to 1. So this will be 3. And then it will, it will add 2 to the 3. So this will just return 5. And you can also pass in the output of another function into the function parameter. So as you can see, the name of the function here returns 42. So add two to forty two, it will give back forty four. Yeah. and also the print function is stored also as another example of function. Okay, so here we have an example of a slightly more complicated function called calculate cat. So um, for demonstration purposes, we assume that all the modules here are on the same weightage. Yeah, so we have a plus a a minus b plus and so on. And so this function will take the number of modules that you total amount of modules that you took and you will sum up the grade points and you will take the average of those grade points. So, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. So there's, there's, this, there's this error here that, that says uh, invalid syntax. So why, 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 why is this showing this? So um, because the plus operator cannot be like the last, uh, it's called the, the, the last character here in a, in a, in a certain line. So there's, Actually, two ways to fix this. The first is you escape the line break by using a backslash. So a backslash is like an escape character. As you see just now, the, you use backslash to escape the, the apostrophe when in the, in the string, you want to say type eats and use backslash to escape the apostrophe. So here, similarly, you can use backslash to escape the line break here. So this could work. But also, there's also another way of doing this and it's to just put a bracket Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's also just to put a bracket here, and it will it will just yeah it will, it will not uh, have the same error. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me let me just let me try zooming in a bit more. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so as you can see, uh, if you want to use this function, let's say the student has two A plus, two A and one A minus. So you refer to this, um, this order, and then you have to count uh, like two A plus, two A's and one A minus, and you call the function like this, and you return you the cat. As you can see, it's a bit tedious because um, like say you have two A's, one A minus and two B plus, and you have to start counting. So the B minus is here. So you should count like one, two, three, four, five, six. And then like one, two, three, four, five, six. It's like very tedious. Yeah. And so and also like because uh you actually only need to input three values, but now you have to input all of the values here. So it's it's a it's a very tedious way of uh, using functions. So in Python there's this uh there's this uh, idea called a keyword arguments. So and also a default arguments. So what what you can do is in a function, when you define a function, you can actually add an equals, the, the, the function parameter, you can put an equals, some, some value behind, and you will, it will default to this value if the function parameter is not provided. So here you can see the default values are zero for, for all the function parameters, and the, the rest of the body statement is the same. And let's just uh, execute this function, uh, define this function. So right now, we only need to define we, when we call a function, we only need to provide those arguments that we want to, that we need to change. So if you say we have three Ds and two T pluses, then we just need to provide these two and we'll calculate the cat here. Yeah. So these are called keyword arguments. So instead of counting like one by one, you can just type in the parameter name and then you just put an equal sign and then into, it equals to the value and you will calculate it as such. Okay. Um, next, we move on to uh, rather complicated concept called the scope and lifetime of variables. Um, this is this is a this might be a confusing concept if you never have um, had this uh, if, you, if you've never had this idea before. So um, don't don't be worried. Don't don't worry. It's not a you might not you might not hit this problem when you first start programming. But sometimes if you don't understand this, then you might hit a confusing box in your program. So okay. So first we we'll talk about the scope of a variable. So a scope of a variable is basically the portion of the program where the variable is recognized. So it, it, when, you, when you define a variable in a function, it is not automatically available throughout the entire program. Yeah, so the parameters and variables defined inside the function are not visible outside the function. So they have, it is called local scope. So this, this is, why, 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 do, why, do, why do programmers, why, 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 do, why does Python do this? So this is because like um, in real life, the progress might be like hundreds or thousands of lines of code. And it might be possible that Two variables are defined with the same name, so we don't. But we do not want them to be have this thing called a namespace collision. So we do not want them to, like maybe 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 the x outside they, want, they, they do not want to refer to the function as the name of x that's inside. So that's why that's why the Python does this. It, the the variables inside the function they only they are only relevant inside the function. They are not they are not defined outside the function. So and there's also this concept called the lifetime of a variable. So the when the function returns and exits all the variables that are created during the execution of the function gets destroyed in memory, so they get removed. So, okay, so we'll step through this program one by one. Okay, so one line by one line. First, we, okay, so first we'll run it. Okay, uh, yeah, the, the error is, there's supposed to be an error here. Um, so first, x equals to, we define a function here. And after that, we call, we put x equals to 20, and we call my function. So inside my function, we define x to be 10 and y equals to 2. So, and then we print what the value of x inside the function is equals to, and it's 10 because the nearest x, the, the x that's in the nearest scope is equals to 10. So the function will use that value instead. So this, this, uh, this, uh, this definition of x will be used instead of the x equals to 20. But if we instead, if we comment out this line, then we can see that it will be 20 because if, if the function cannot find the, the, uh, the x in, inside the function, then it will move on to the surrounding scope, which is this here over here, x equals to 20. Yeah. And we can print y equals to 2. But as you can see, we try to, when we try to print, okay, so uh, before that, we print x outside the function is equals to 20. Because the fun also when you're outside the function, there's no way you can see what's inside the function. Yeah. And when you try to print like say a, a variable like y range, which is not defined outside the function, then you get a name error, uh, y is not defined. Yep. So this is like 
just a concept, important concept to know. Okay, next, we'll move on to a, a functions challenge. So as, as just now you guys wrote a, uh, some, some, some of the uh, expressions using hypotenuse. So when given the length of the other two sides of a right angle triangle, uh, which you call B and C, uh, write a function to return the length of a hypotenuse. So um, I'll give you guys three minutes to do this. Yeah, so this function should take in B and C and should return the length of the hypotenuse. So uh, once, once you are done, uh, please give a green tick in the participants panel. Oh, sorry, a pass, a pass is not the same as a return. Yeah. If, if you just delete this line. Yeah, just, just remove the pass entirely. Yeah. If you guys are done, please uh, repeat with a green tape so we know that it's time to move on. I'll move on. So um, we want to return the length of the hypotenuse if the other two sides are B and C of a right angle triangle. So first, so you can do this in one line. Yes. So first you start with the return keyword. And after that, you can just straight away provide the expression itself. You don't need to like uh, make any other lines here. Like, uh, so you can have B to the power of two plus c to the power of 2 and then we raise it we take the square root of the number is 0 0.5 yeah. and now if you call the function hypot 
and that's very correctly okay. And let's say you put three and four, this should give five. Yep. Okay, so now we move back to the slides. Uh Ito, can you go back to the notebook? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, some of them are saying that they are not saying the name Y is not defined error, the on top, the name error. Oh, they're not seeing this error. Yes, uh, because right, just now in the variable challenge, I define Y as 4. Oh, okay. So you, do you want to just change the example a bit? Like, uh, just tell them what to change so that they can see the error. Okay, so I like change it to YY. Yeah. Y, y yeah. Then it will be, yeah, it will be the same. Yeah, because in collect notebooks, the entire previous cells they will get, yeah, they they remember the variables and whatever that's executed before. Yeah. yeah. The the idea is just uh, if we are outside, we cannot see the y y that is inside the function. Yeah. Yep. That's the main idea of it. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so now we're moving to uh, build in data structures. Okay, so data structures is like kind of like. To explain, it's basically a container for data values. So um, the most important and uh, frequently used data structure, I, I, think I would say, is the list. Yeah, so a list is basically like uh, an ordered, basically a, you can put in values inside a list and it will be, it's an ordered, ordered, ordered values in the sequence, basically. Yeah, so uh, we have some examples here. So uh, here's a list of strings of animals. So cat, bat, rat, elephant. We have a list of uh, integers as well. And in Python, you can have a list of multiple different data types. So here in this tree, you can have a list of a float, an integer, a string, and also another list. Yeah, so a list can just basically contain, like, yeah, a list of anything. Yeah. In other programming languages, sometimes they refer to list as arrays or whatever, but in Python, they call it list. Okay, so how do you assess like individual values inside a list? So we call this uh, list indicing. So basically, uh, okay, in programming, as I, as, I said, as I said before, in programming, we count from zero. So the first value is uh, called, the, we, 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 we call the first value, in like the first in English, in, we, we assess it by using the zero index. So um, we, we open, so if spam is this list of uh, animals and we want the first element, then we just uh, spam uh, square bracket zero. So this is called list indicing. So, uh, list indices are basically uh, these uh, numbers 0, 1, 2, 3 like assigned, assigned to the list. Yeah, so these are indices. So um, spam 0 is cat and the, and the second element is the first index, so it's, it's bat. Right, and the third element is uh, the second index, which is rat. And if you try to assess, so the last element is uh, spam, is, is, is 3. So if you put spam bracket 3, it will give you elephant. But what if you try to assess like beyond that, the indices beyond that? So when you uh, so the length of the, the spam is spam list is four, but if you try to assess four, it will give you an error called list index out of range because there's no fifth element inside the list. Yeah, so okay, in, in Python there's also like a convenient shorthand to get the second, the, say the last element of the list or the second last element of the list. You use this called a negative index. So this is zero, right? But if you want negative one, like say before that, then you will, will look back to the start. So you will look back to the, the end. So like negative one is actually elephant. Yeah, and negative three will be, so this is negative one. Negative one, negative two, negative three will be that. Yeah, okay, so next we have this diagram to explain. Like, so here we, we say we have a list of five, five letters. Yeah, P-R-O-B-E. And the index for the first element is zero. And the last element is always length minus one. Yeah, just, just remember like length minus one because we start counting from zero, but length is like, it starts counting from one. So it, it's always length minus one. Yeah. So, and for negative indices, yeah, the last element is negative one and the first element is negative length. Yeah, so when you're confused, just remember this diagram. Okay, so what if we want like a multiple, a range of values inside a list? So we call this a list slicing. So basically we turn a range of values inside a list. So, uh, how this works is the similar to the range function, the first number is inclusive and the last number is exclusive. Yeah, it's a similar pattern. So it will include the first element and so 0, 1, 2, 3, but there's no fourth. So it's excluding fourth. So it will return everything from 0, 1, 2, 3 inclusive. 
So this will just return the entire list. And you can start from a, a different index. So if you start from one and you end at three, so this is one, but three is exclusive. So it will include bat, which is one, and we include red, which is two, but you will not include elephant because it's excluding the number three. Okay. And to find out the length of a list, you just use the length function. You return the number of values that are inside the list. And it, also you can count the number of characters inside a string, so like the length function. Okay, so just now we, when we talk about string concatenation, so now we have this thing called a, a list concatenation. So concatenation is basically adding two things together and just joining them together. Yeah, so in Python, this concatenation is also using the plus operator. So we have one, two, and three plus the, another list of A, B, and C, and then you will just return a new list with one, two, three, A, B, C. Yeah, and in Python, you also have a shorthand for, if you want to like say, replicate a list multiple times, you have just used the asterisk and then you multiply by three and it will give x, y, z three times. So x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, adding elements to a list. So um, if you want to add elements, there's a couple of ways to do over it. First, you have, you have this uh, append function with a list. So um, you add the element to the end of the list. So if you have a list called Larry, Curly, and Mo, and you have called list.append uh, shank. And the shank will be added to the end of the list. So that's what the append function does. It, it, it changes the list in place. So it does not return you a new list. It just modifies the list, original list. So we call it a mutation. We mutate the original list in programming terms. Okay, another way, what, what if you want to add an element to like the middle of the list? So there's this thing called an insert function. So it insert, it takes in two arguments, uh, index, the list index that you want to insert at, and also the element. So um, here we have a list, uh, of the, the, just now the list, Larry, Curly, Mo, Shem. And what if you want to in insert this string inside the second, let's say we're going to insert in the middle. So if you want to insert in the middle, so that, that new element will be at index two, because this is index zero, this is index one, and then the new element will be at index two. So we call insert two, and then there's the, the, the new string here, and then you can see the new string gets inserted at index two, and the rest of the values get bumped uh, by one index. Yeah, so. Okay, so if, if you want to remove element from a list, there's also two ways to go about it. The first is a remove value. So it, it will remove the first matching value from the list. This does not, so, so what this does is say we have a list called A, and it has zero, two, three, two. When you remove two, you will, you will go through the list one by one and you will find the first value inside the list that matches uh, the value. So if you have two here, so it will remove the first occurrence of the two and that's it. The, the other occurrence of two will be just left there. Yeah, so this one way of removing, uh, if you try to like you want to remove a certain value from a list. And there's another, remove, uh, there's, there's another way of removing by index. So let's say you want to remove the middle element here. So we can just call a uh, a.pop1. So the so this is zero index, this is one index. So the we call a dot pop one, it will return the value at the first index. So when you return the value at the first index, you can assign it to a different thing, or you can just ignore it. Huh? Yeah, so if we call b equals to a dot pop one, then you can see that a has been modified to become four and five. Like the the, the, sec, the first index element is removed, and b is now equals to the three because a dot pop re returns the element that it removes. Okay, so another very common thing to do is to check if something is inside a list. So we in Python, there's this thing called a list membership operator, which is basically in or not in. So if howdy is in this list, and it will return to a it will return a boolean, so true, yeah, because howdy is here. And let's say we have another list called spam, and if cat is in spam, uh, so it returns false because cat is not in spam. And also the not in operator. So howdy is not in spam, but howdy is in spam. So uh, this will return to false because howdy is in spam. Yep. Okay, so sometimes you want to iterate through a list, like the, each of the elements inside a list, to maybe to like to print it or to do certain operations with it. So in, the, in Python, there's the handy shortcut called a for in loop. So how this works is say we have this uh, called a supply supplies. 
and you, there's a list of pens, staplers, and flamethrowers and binders. So we iterate it through like four in loop. So four, and you have a variable name here. This can be any any variable name you want, but usually the convention is to for the list to be the plural and for the variable here to be the singular form. So it reads like English. Yeah, so for supply in supplies, then you print the supply. So you iterate through each of the, the values inside the list and you will you will, you will print it. So pens, staplers, flame colors, binders. So now we move the collect notebook. Okay. So these are like as you can see, this is how a list looks like in collect. So um, you can see like the, if you if you try to this is a string representation of a list in, in, in Python. And when you, when you want to assess a certain value, you just put square bracket and it will be apple. And the, the last value will be at the second index. So pass is at, because this is three. So the last value is at index two. And we try to assess beyond that, that you give you an error. Okay, and the oily slicing, you can see this, as we went through just now, uh, the two is excluded. So it does not include the index at two. So it's just zero and one. And we you can see like the same list in Python can con contain any data type, even another list. And yeah, as you see, this is my list. It's actually the, this list over here. Just now the apples, oranges, and pears. So if you if you look at this a list, you can see apples, uh, ones, uh, and, th and this float here, and also the another list inside a list. So how do you assess the values of a list inside a list? You just put two square brackets. So the first square bracket, so let's say you want to assess uh, apples. So the first square bracket is always the original, the, 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 the outside list, the, the containing list. So this list is at the third index. So you just put three for the first square bracket. And after that, you want to assess apples. So you put another square bracket inside. So if without this, it will just return you the list over here. So you just put another square bracket and then it will, it will return you apples. Yeah, someone mentioned about list comprehension. Um, we we will go through that if we have time. Yeah, but because it's not a common, it's not like it is. It's commonly used in Python, but we in most other languages there's no such concept of a list comprehension, so we do not go through it now. Um, so list concatenation, as you can see, um, you can you 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 just join it two lists together, and uh, adding elements. So if you want to add bananas to the end of the list, you can use the dot append function yeah you do not assign so a common mistake is to you assign it to to this list but this will not do anything like this will this will give you like if you try to print like my list right now it will be non yeah so so it, it, will, it will just be non so you okay, can type type of my list and it's a non type because the dot append function it mutates the original list it changes the original list in place it does not return you a new list, so you cannot assign it to anything. You just have to call it dot append, and then you can look at the, the original list. So right now, if you run it again, then you will be correct. Yep. Okay, and similar to all the other operations like dot insert, they do not return you the list. So you have to just call it without assigning it back to my list. So if you want to insert dragon fruit into a second index, you can call it like this. And if you call dot pop, without specifying the index, you can, it will just remove the last element. So like a pen adds to the end, so dot pop will remove the last element and we will return, return it. So you can see right now bananas is being returned. And if you look at the original list, yeah, it will be, it will, the bananas is being removed. And also you can specify an index to remove it. So you have dot pop one, and you can see the index, the, or the value at the first index is being removed. So right now, oranges is being removed. So like, um, just as just how you said, the for in loop, you can iterate through the fruits inside the list using this this uh, very very simple syntax. So for fruit in my list, and you print the fruit, and you like this. Okay, so sometimes uh, you want the list to be in sorted order. So um, in Python, there's two ways to sort a list. So a list can be sorted as long as uh, the values inside a list they are comparable using a compare using the comparator. So the comparator operator is something like this. 
Yeah, so the greater than or you know, like this, yeah. So it, as long as they can be compared, so like strings can be compared because alphabetical order, numbers can be compared, floats can be compared, like see which one is bigger than which. Yeah, so so if you have so the first way to sort a list is to use the sorted function. So the sorted function it does not mutate the original list. So it does not change the original list. It will just return you a new list that is sorted. So that, that is the one way of doing it. And it's usually the preferred way because usually in programming, it is a, not a good idea to mutate the original list in case you want to use the original later on. So as you can see here, sorted fruits is in alphabetical order now, A, B, D, O, P. Now the original one is not. And, but if you look at the original list, fruits, yeah, the original list is still left un unchanged because sorted does not change the original list. But there's also another way is to use the dot sort method. And this will mutate the original list. So if you right now, if you run these numbers and we dot sort it, it will give the numbers its ascending order and the original list is being mutated. Okay, so now we have, uh, we have oh, it's almost time, that's where I Okay, so in the interest of time, we will not, uh, we will just go through these exercises, uh, yeah. Um, because right now it's already almost three, yeah. So if you want to get the item named dragon fruit, um, so what we do is we just take the list, and then we use the square packet notation to assess the index. So dragon fruit is at the second index because it's the third item is the second index. So. We can do this and we can check that dragon fruit is indeed dragon fruit. Yep, indeed. So, okay, so the next exercise, we have these numbers 1 to 10. And then um, we want to insert the missing number, which is number 4. So, what we do is we can use the dot insert function. So, numbers 1 to 10, dot insert. So, we, we, we remember, remember that. The first argument is the index that you want to insert at. So the fourth, the fourth, you want to insert it at the zero, one, two, three, the third, the third index, because it is the fourth element. So it's at, we want to insert it at the third index. And then the next argument is the value that you want to insert. So you want to insert four. So if you do this, and then you, you see what is the numbers one to 10. Okay, so now we have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Okay. So this next exercise is a little hard. Yeah. So you want to create a new list of odd numbers using the numbers one to ten by iterating through the list and checking divisibility by two. Okay, so how you do this is let's say you create a new list, odd numbers equals two. So this this empty square bracket will create a new empty list. And we want to iterate through the original list. So for number in numbers, it autocomplete does it. Okay. Numbers, you only want to add it to the odd numbers if it is divisible, if it is divisible by two. So if number modulo two not equals, so if the remainder, so if the number is odd, then when you try to modulo it by two, the remainder will be, not, will be equal to one. So it will not be equal to zero. So if it's not equal to zero, so the miss is odd, then you call odd numbers dot append. So you, you can just add in the ele elements to the list one by one, dot append number. You run it, and you check that odd numbers is indeed, indeed this. Okay, so it's just now we mentioned about uh, these comprehensions. So just to give you guys an idea of this comprehension, so we have this uh, number here. So you can just, in, in Python, there's a shorthand one line. So as you can see here, we took three, three four lines to do it. But in Python, you can always also do a one-liner. So number for num number in numbers one to 10, if number modulo two not equals to zero. So this will also give the same list. So as you can see, this is called a list comprehension. It's basically a shorthand syntax for or like uh, it's, it's, it's like in, in Python, they like to they like syntax to be short and concise. Yeah. So, but, but we'll not go through this today. It's just to like give you a taste of what like some some of the Python code you might you might see, and so like give you a taste of like why people might prefer to use Python in some cases because it it's faster to code certain things in Python. 
Uh, it's how some students ask about array multiplication. You want to show an example of that with least comprehension? So array multiplication. So like suppose you have a list one, two, three, you want to like multiply no multiply throughout. Oh okay, okay. So okay, let, let's see. We have a list uh let's say num numbers equals to one, two, three. And you want to multiply it throughout. Wait, so if you try to do it like this, it will return you because it will return you the list that's like uh, basically replicated. So um you, one way to do it is to use the, the, the list comprehension. Yeah, but another way to do it is to so uh, you cannot use the for in loop because if you try to use the for in loop, okay, this is uh this is it for number in numbers. You try to call it like number times number equals to number times three. So you you might and then if you check the num if you check check the numbers now, you notice that it's not being multiplied because this this number here is not it does not con it does not refer to the the original uh, value in the list. It's, it's basically like it copies it some it copies it from original list. So it does not mutate the original one. So to do this, you actually have to go back to using a, 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 like using the range using the range function. So let's say for i in range. So um, usually this this is like a, the typical way you do it. So a range the length of the list. So the length of the list is three. So range goes from 0, 1, 2, and it excludes number 3. So this is just nice because the index is 0, 1, 2. And then you take numbers, the i, and then it equals to, actually, uh, you can also use this shortcut to multiply by 3. Yeah. So this should give you the multiply by 12. There's also a least comprehension way of doing it, but yeah, we will not go through that now in the interest of time. Okay, so uh, we will quickly run through the other data structures that are built in that like, just, just, just for like a, a, a quick uh, a taste of what, what other data structures in Python look like. So as you mentioned in the, one of the beginning slides, Python is very uh, useful for algorithm interviews because they have a lot of built-in data structures. You do not need to import anything, they are just there for you to use. So it's very convenient. So there's a thing called a tuple. So a tuple is basically very similar to a list, almost identical to a list, except that you cannot change the values of inside a tuple. So they are like a list, but it's, it's an immutable. You cannot, you cannot modify it. So you can see this tuple here is, instead of using the square packet, you use a round packet. And you can use uh, the same in indexing notation as you use the inside a list. So the first, the first index is two. But you try to modify it, then you will say a, a tuple object does not support item assignment. You cannot change it. Is, is immutable. So sometimes you do not want to, so in a, in a list you can reassign the value to be something else, but sometimes you do not want this kind of behavior, so you can enforce it by using a tuple. Okay, so um, next we will have this thing called a dictionary. So in other languages, this is also known as uh, a hash table or something else. Uh, so a diction, in Python you call it a dictionary. So basically sometimes instead of using the index, you want to use say, uh, a, a string. You want to use a string to assess a value. So you can use a dictionary in, in that case. So let's say you have this phone numbers dictionary. So Jane has this phone number, Tom has that phone number, Billy has that phone number. If you use a list, then it will just be a phone numbers and you don't know you don't know who who the phone number belongs to. Yeah, you have to in, you have to assess the phone number by index, which is a bit confusing. So you need to use two lists, one list of names and one list of phone numbers, and then say they have to be in the same order. So it's like prone to errors. So you can use this thing and you can assess the dictionary. You can assess the value inside the dictionary by uh, just calling the, so this, this, this is called a key and this is called a value. So the dictionary is called a key value pair, like the key value pairs. So you just uh, use the, the square bracket notation and instead of like the, in the list, you give the index, you give, now you give the key, the, the, the value of a key, so which is top. So you give this phone number, which is, yeah. Okay, so lastly, we'll move on to sets. So sets are basically unordered. So they, they do not have, so in, in sets, they, there's no order. So we will talk about it later. So it's an unordered collections of unique items. So they are like, it looks like it's the same curly bracket as the dictionary, but 
you do not have the colon. You just have a, 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 a it looks like, you basically can think of it like a, a tuple and a list by using the, the this, this curly bracket. So how is it different from tuples and lists? So basically, you can only have unique items. So if we try to say members here and we try to add Jane to members, but because there's already Jane here, it will not include Jane a second time. And also, as you can see, they are not ordered. So even though we specify the order here, Jane, Tom, and Billy, the set does not recall what order we have really specified. It's not ordered. So why do we use sets? So in sets, uh, in, in, when, you, when, you, when you want to check membership in sets, say like if a certain value is in a set, like say if Bob is in members, false. If Jane is members, true. So we want to check membership in a set. It is faster than checking membership in a list. So that's, that's one of the reasons it's being used. And also because you want to have, say, you have a unique collection of items. You, don't, you, know what, you do not want duplicates, then you can use a set. This, this can be useful in that situation. Okay, so it's, it's almost three. Now we'll move back to the, the last few. Okay, so now I'll talk about some of the syntax for importing modules and packages. We are not talking about importing, how to import. Yeah, but this is just like some of the syntax that we will learn in the next Python workshop, which is two weeks from now. So in Python, there's uh, this thing called a standard library. So it comes with every Python installation. You do not need to install any third-party uh, libraries or anything. It, it just comes with Python itself. But you need to import it. So this is called a standard library. It comes with a lot of batteries included. So there's date time, there's OS, and other standard libraries. Um, and also there's third-party imports. You say you install a third-party library, and you can uh, import it using this, this index. So we will we'll cover this in the next workshop. And for, also for the next workshop, you need to have Python installed locally, which means you need to have Python installed on your own computer instead of using the Colette notebook. This is because we need to uh, run the .py files, so we need to have Python installed locally. So there's two ways of installing Python. So if you just want Python on its own, you can try to follow this guide. Um, or if you want to install Python with Anaconda, you can follow this link to download it. So if you don't know which one to choose, um, I would personally recommend Anaconda. It makes your life a bit simpler, you will like, it resolves dependencies a bit easier and it also like, it comes with a built-in environment manager. So if you don't know what to choose, just pick Anaconda. Okay. Um, uh, and basically Anaconda makes it easier for you to install third-party packages. So like uh, right now, all we've been doing now is just running our own code. But, uh, but if you use Anaconda, you can easily like download other people's code where, who, where they have already like implemented certain useful things that you can just use straight out of the box. Yep. Okay, so most of the time, um, installing Python will be quite straightforward in uh, Mac or Linux. But in Windows, you might have some issues running with uh, the paths or, or whatnot. Yeah. So you may need to follow a guide for that case. So these are some of the other things we do not have time to cover. So uh, classes and objects, the standard library, Python environments, and also type hinting. So if you have time on your own and you'd like to learn more, you can please uh, just feel free to Google and find like online guides. There are plenty of online guides on this. Okay, so now we reach to the end of the workshop. So uh, we would really appreciate if you can give us some feedback for using this uh, link to the Google form. And also if you'd like to uh, come for our next workshop, the two weeks from now, you can sign up using the link here. We'll, we'll, we'll drop it in the Zoom chat for ease of. Yeah, so that's all for this workshop and Thank you for coming. Yep, if you have uh, any questions, feel free to ask us. We will yeah, still sure. be around. We will hang around for a few minutes. Yeah, we really appreciate it if you could like do the few other feedback because uh, I think it's both me and Ethos first ever hacker school session that we're teaching. So we really like like it if like you guys could give some comments about how you felt that it was run and stuff. Um, I have someone messaging me asking if Hacker School next week, uh, two weeks from now can be starting from 2 p.m. instead. So 
if you guys think that it's better to start at 2 p.m., maybe you can please indicate in the feedback form. Yeah. Yes, but uh, no worries as well. Uh, most likely, uh, we'll just start at 1 and also all our sessions are recorded. So even today's one will also be uploading on YouTube. Okay, so we have a question. So we want to re-explain the part about another list. Mm, okay, where is it? Okay, so uh, can so the, the, the question is could I please re explain the part about another list? Square packet, square packet. Okay, uh let me see. Okay, so this is basically okay. So I'm not I'm not I'm not, I'm not, I'm not use this example. I'll use another example. So uh, usually in uh in programming, like sometimes uh there's this thing called a matrix. Uh, so like, a matrix is basically a two. A, you can think of it as a two D array. So uh, let's say you have a let's say you have a a two D nested array of these. So this, this is like a, a 2D, 2D list, so called. So it's a list of lists. And sometimes, so a matrix is, it comes out a lot in computing. So it's like, it can be used to represent like images and stuff. Yeah, so um, how, how the square packet, square packet notation works is, say you have, okay, so let's, let's, let's call this a, a matrix. First, let's assign this to a matrix. Um, so the, f oh, that is not defined. So the first square packet, so the first, uh, if, so the outer list is actually just consists of three elements. The first list, the second list, and the third list. So when you assess the, when you put only one square packet, you will just assess this, which is the first list. Yeah, so and, and if, you, if you put like, uh, the index two, it will be the second list, yeah, and so on. So when you want to assess an individual element inside of this, then you just put another square bracket. So let's say you want to assess two. So this will be at index two. And this will give you two. Yeah. So instead you want to assess like say this this value. So this is in the second list. So it's in the the second list is uh, the first index. And let's say you want to uh okay, so you, you say you want to have number four. So number four is also in the second index. So this will give you number number four. Sorry, sorry, number four is in the first index. <laughs> so you need to change this to the first index. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and which is four. Yeah. 